Top 20 Elden Ring Infusible Weapons for Shadow of the Earth Tree. Who cares about intros? Let's get into it. The Gleanron Knight Swords are wielded by the elite soldiers of Melania, Elden Ring's most fraudulent character who can only be General Adon via high fantasy nuclear warfare. However, the Gleanron Knights were warriors who fought fiercely and with much valor. They were completely loyal to Melania, fraud of Mikla, but a quote from the Feli Lu comes to mind. Your only mistake was your choice of master. The Clean Rot Knight Sword is a thrusting sword. Because of its bad power stance moveset, it's best to use two-handed. And really quick guys, weapons like Curve Sword and Straight Swords that are ideal when their power stance and only really good in that aspect are not going to be making this list because quite frankly, I wasn't sure how to qualify that because a lot of them wouldn't make up the top 10. That may get its own list at some point. But despite being a two-handed weapon, its stance damage is very poor, and you will not be breaking stances much at all. Its damage itself though is very good, and let me get my usual rant out of the way nice and early for the video. Pierce damage is your best attack type in Elden Ring because of counterattack damage. Counterattacks are a mechanic unique to thrusting attacks that give you bonus damage to enemies when they are in their attack frames. Because enemies are more aggressive than ever in Elden Ring, this bonus damage really adds up over the course of a boss fight. With thrusting weapons, it is a good idea to pair them with the Spear Talisman for further damage for the counterattacks. And I do apologize for this rant being in every video, but it's always surprising how many people don't know about it because of how poorly FromSoft explains it. But that'll be the only time in this video I say it. Just remember, thrust is a plus. To summarize, thrusting swords do great damage because they're fast and do piercing attacks. However, you won't be getting much stance damage at all and that is a big weakness to have. I really do think the S-Doc deserves a mention as well because I do think it comes down to preference. The S-Doc gets a horizontal slash which is really valuable to like vary your moveset a little bit. Say you're surrounded by smaller enemies and mobs, you want to get a few of them out of the way at once. But for me personally, I think the Clean Rot Knight's damage is enough to make up for that and I think it performs better. Just put a Millicent's Prothesis, Rotten Wing Sword Insignia, and then add the Spear Talisman and a Dragon Crest Great Shield and you're going to be doing great DPS and downing bosses in no time. The Godskin Stitcher is used by the Godskin Nobles, followers of the Glomide Queen who use Black Flame capable of killing the gods. These sick fucks wear the skins of the gods and people they hunt, they flay them alive and then wear them as clothes like that. Who comes up with this stuff? FromSoft really are some evil twisted people. They do have some of the most interesting lore, things about the Glomide Queen, how it originated. I think you guys should check out Smotown because he has a lot of videos on it going very in depth and tell him I sent you because I'm a bit of a fanboy. The Godskin Stitcher is a heavy thrusting sword. They do pierce damage almost exclusively. Remember, thrust is a plus. On a charged heavy attack, thrusting swords do the same stance damage as a charged heavy attack from a great sword. It's one of the best aspects about them the Godskin Stitcher is interesting in that its heavy attack actually does two stabs, a very solid and stylish option that's very reliable. My best advice is between those boss fights, you want to use Flaming Strike or another AoE Ash of War because taking down multiple enemies can be a pain with constant target switching when you only have access to stabs. Definitely a great weapon. The Black Steel Great Hammer has lore I've not delved into yet, but it's a big ass hammer that looks cool. You get this Great Hammer 5 minutes into the DLC after killing a relatively easy enemy. Great Hammers are an incredible class on paper because on the opposite end of the spectrum of our last entry, they do the highest stance damage in the game. They are also a lot faster than weapon types with a similar playstyle being strength builds that break stance. Why did I say on paper though? The actual options we get in terms of the individual themselves are severely lacking, but now we have another truly great one. The Black Steel Great Hammer is an amazing strength weapon, having an A scaling and a heavy infusion. If you are using it on a level 125 build for the most multiplayer activity, this does the most damage on a strength build for a Great Hammer, making it your second best option. Stay tuned. This is before getting into the wacky things you can start doing with its card counter. It has a unique ability. After a successful guard counter, you will throw a wave of holy damage at the enemy. It has perfect synergy with the deflect hard tier. I unfortunately did not feel comfortable accounting for this because I don't 
don't really use guard counters, if at all, and I think a majority of the player base doesn't either. It's very underutilized. I didn't look at any other lists on YouTube because I was trying to make this list true to myself and not just copy other people, but this was the one exception because it was a mechanic I didn't really understand. So after looking at this, I still don't feel comfortable, but just let me know what you guys think if you've done this, how much further you would rank it up. But even if you don't do this, it's still a great option nonetheless. Here I'm fighting Godfrey on New Game 7, and it was perfectly acceptable without this, doing great damage, despite it saying I can't wield it, if you have the strength requirement, you will do the physical damage, it's only not giving you the guard counter. The best weapon of the new category of light great swords. If this was based purely on fun, it may be in a category of its own. In Elden Ring, there is no true to life longsword. If you weren't aware, longswords were two-handed swords that were smaller than weapons considered great swords. Straight swords of these games are considered arming swords in real life, and great swords in this are beyond anything a human can wield. This is not a complaint by the way, because I truly consider those HEMA guys who criticize how realistic video game sword play are some of the world's most maidenless people. It's a fucking video game. All this is to say is the Light Great Sword is the closest thing we have to a real life long sword. I really like all three of the additions, but this is the cream of the crop. A quick look at the wiki will tell you that if that it works on every infusion. Some better than others, but you can always make it work. Light Great Swords can work on successive attack builds with synergizing talismans because of their quick attacks even swinging twice on a heavy attack, but at a quick speed. Its stance break is similar to heavy thrusting swords. Light attacks are quick, but their stance damage really isn't much. So you can pile up the damage that way, but if you want to do a posture breaking build, you kind of can with the heavy attacks. And that's kind of something that can be combined with the Ashes of War. But really, why wouldn't you use wing stance? It really just feels so natural and fits the weapon well, and it really does a lot of damage, but is also really fun to use. And timing it really feels like it is a skill, unlike just spamming L2. However, all that being said, if you're spamming the Ash of War on this weapon, you are not playing it right, because they've never had a weapon with such a fun moveset. Chaining together light and heavy attacks has never felt so smooth. It's just incredible. I can talk about this weapon alone for another 10 minutes. The Zweihander and Claymore at this point will always be my favorites. If I were to have a true heart to heart with myself and why that is, it's because nostalgia is the world's most powerful drug. It's why I wasted about 17 hours a day on old school RuneScape during the pandemic. Milady really is a work of art and it does feel like FromSoft just keeps upping their game with the weapons. Overall though, it's a very good weapon but not spectacular. Maybe on the lower side of A tier when you can find that with all the weapons with unique skills that are overpowered, but S plus tier and fun. I definitely know which one matters more to me. Before Shadow of the Earth Tree, the best curved greatsword mostly came down to preference. If you like damage over range, you would probably pick the Omen Cleaver, but the longer range of the Dismounter but with less damage really made for an interesting choice. Now, unfortunately for those two, there's a new sheriff in town, and it's called the Freya's Greatsword. There's a lot of things going for this weapon. One is just its damage. Its AR is better than both the Dismounter and the Omen Cleaver by a pretty fair amount. And this doesn't come at the sacrifice of range either because it's right in the middle of them. What makes it even better, and really propels it to a top 20 spot, is it has a passive ability that increases the damage of red main skills. Now, those include Savage Lion's Claw, Lion's Claw, Flame of the Red Mains, and someone told me in the comment section as well, Flaming Strike, I haven't tested that out yet, I've heard conflicting things, but I'll trust him for now. And Flaming Strike is one of your best PvP abilities, but this is a PvE list, and let's be real, Lion's Claw is pretty OP, I think that and Giant's Hunt are the best ones you can use, and Lion's Claw is able to be used on a Curve Greatsword. So, if you combine that with Shard of Alexander, you're going to be doing massive damage. It now makes Dismounter and Omen Cleaver redundant. I'd have to think about it, but the Dismounter may have made this top 20 beforehand, and that's the one I'm going to continue to use, just because I like the brutal look, on a personal note. But yes, that's where it lands. This weapon was used by Tragoth the Bullgoat, 
who is honestly just a solid bro and stand-up guy because all he's known for is as a famed knight of assistance for helping tarnish around the lands between survive against great adversity. Of course, you're likely going to end up mercilessly killing him anyway because he does drop amazing armor. And believe it or not, this is a strength weapon. It requires 60 strength to wield, but if you didn't know, two-handing a weapon makes you able to use this weapon to its fullest at much lower levels. The minimum level to wield the giant crusher will be 40 with two hands. If you are keeping your character at level 125 for the maximum multiplayer activity for co-op and PvP, I would highly recommend going no higher than 54 to meet the last soft cap of 80. If you don't understand what soft and hard caps are, I'll definitely link something in the description for that. That explains it just for the sake of time, just because this is a weapon tier list. And don't feel dumb looking something up like this because it, FromSoft has a lot of mechanics that are either not explained at all or explained poorly. It has the highest weight of any weapon in Elden Ring, coming in at 26 and a half units. Its range though is somehow below average. It is a colossal weapon too, which does have a pretty bad move set. In return, you get damage that is just the highest in the game. Very, very few weapons are even going to come close. The most common strategy with this weapon is to use Royal Knight's Resolve and use a charge attack, which if you didn't know on the Giant Crusher, is more of just like a mini Lion's Claw. You flip front, flip forward, and do a devastating attack. It's definitely not a weapon for everyone though, me included. It does one thing, and it does it better than anyone else. There's a lot of drawbacks to this weapon, but you're just not going to find this damage on any other weapon. The Knight's Greatsword and Banished Knight's Greatsword will share this spot as they're nearly identical. They have a very cool looking light combo, but honestly, I'm not sure how much more or less effective it is. I mean that literally because I'm not sure, and this was something I did use the wiki for and couldn't really find a straight answer. It does seem slightly faster, and more importantly, it looks cooler. And if you look good, you play good after all. All in all, these are two of your go-to greatswords that can be found early with some farming and can take you from Limgrave all the way to the Elden Throne. The Banished Knight Sword does slightly more damage and the Knight's Great Sword has more range, but not really a significant amount for PvE. It really does come down to preference. Quite honestly, I would just pick which one looks cooler for you. This is a PvE list, but I wanted to note for you that if you're going to dip your toe in PvP, the Knight's Great Sword is actually considered the best Great Sword for it. That's because it has access to true combos, as does the Banished Knight's Great Sword, but because of the Knight Great Sword's better range, it's much easier to pull these off. I'm no expert at PvP. I would definitely look up other people's videos to see what those true combos are. I can't pull them off. Number 14 is where they land. I got slightly roasted in my Discord, which will be in the pinned comment by the way, for how much I point out the pierce damage thing, as I've said in this video. And they pointed out to me that the Rusted Anchor does only pierce attacks. So naturally, I did have to give it a try after thinking this was purely a meme weapon. And sure enough, it's pretty good. Uh, this is the Fire Giant on New Game 7. And when I was able to get close to him, it really did tear him to shreds. The range feels short, but if you get in close, you can make it work. Interestingly enough, it's a great axe. I thought it would count as a colossal weapon, but apparently not. While it still looks like a meme weapon, make no mistake about it, this is pretty solid. I highly suggest checking it out if you want to use a goofy looking weapon that's still viable. It scales A in strength, and after a lot of buffs since release, so if you haven't played since the beginning and you're back for Shadow of the Earth Tree, Great Axes have been buffed many times. They're no longer a very bad weapon, they're actually pretty good, the small axe is just one handed ones aren't. But I definitely think you guys should give this a try because it's fast, the pierce damage is good, and it actually feels like it does a lot of stance as well. All in all, great weapon. The Great Epe is phenomenal. You find it in the very beginning of the game, as in not even 10 minutes in, you can just go get it with a horse. It has primarily pierce attacks, but unlike every other heavy thrusting swords, you get a wide slash for its heavy attack. Slashes aren't just good for multiple enemies, as those sweeping attacks are so helpful against gargoyles and say dragons, those kind of big enemies but have thin legs. All heavy thrusting swords have good range, and especially the Great Epe where it's near the top of its category. It's comparable to the Godskin Skitcher, but I think that horizontal slash is what really makes the difference. 
For the rest of the weapon in its class, I'd suggest using something that can hit multiple enemies at once because of those stabs. When you don't have a different attack, it's really limiting. But the Great Epe can use whatever you want because those slashes can hit multiple opponents. Think about it this way. People love the Claymore and Zweihander for their heavy attacks being thrust. The Great Epe is giving you the same thing just the other way around. That kind of versatility is a beautiful thing. Start putting some goddamn respect on the Great Epe's name. I'm sick of it not being talked about. I feel like everyone's gaslighting me or I'm at the center of some lands between wide joke that I'm not in on. This weapon really needs to be talked about more because we just talked about the Knight's Great Sword and Banished Knight's Great Sword not too far back. I really prefer the Banished Knight's Great Sword or Knight's Great Sword especially because of the style point, but really you're just not going to be able to convince me that they're better, as much as I do love those weapons. I seriously don't get why you guys are sleeping on it, and you know why? In case you didn't know, this is a great sword with bleed. There's really not much to say other than that. The downsides are that it has a bad moveset, just the basic one shared with like the iron great sword, the bastard sword, things like that. But and its damage is lower, but think about if it had a high AR with bleed. It would absolutely be overpowered. Stop sleeping on my guy. Put respect on the Flamberg's name. The Mesmer Soldier Spear is a great spear, and any weapon that deals pierce damage as its primary attack is already worth a look. If you didn't hear my rant about counterattack damage because you're skipping around in chapters, just go to the first entry at number 20. Even outside of this, Great Spears are an amazing weapon class. Each of his attack stance damage is the same as Great Swords, Curved Great Swords, Great Katanas, and Great Axes. That really is something I don't think about, and stance damage is such an important mechanic. Setting it bosses up for critical attacks, or just unleashing attacks on them when they're stunned, really is so important, especially with these infusible weapons when we can't just unload a weapon skill on them. And this category of weapons has never really been my favorite, because the Great Spear is kind of just, I don't really like the only stabbing, 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 and they just kind of look ugly. But after testing it on a few bosses, I really realized they are worth the hype in every way. Before this, there was only one infusible Great Spear, believe it or not, in the Lance. And now this one just outclasses it on every infusion. So that's really the reason the Lance isn't on here. It probably could be a top 20 weapon somewhere, but it is kind of redundant to have both on here. Now, I was looking online, and I think if you're killed by an invader with this weapon, or the lance, it's definitely a good idea to cry to strangers on Reddit about this. I'm guessing you get a buff or something, because of just how many times I saw it happen, there's probably some benefit. I could be completely wrong about this, but it's something to keep an eye on. A lot of stabbing weapons are the most powerful weapons in PvP. But in PvE, they don't always get their due, and I think the Great Spear is a very good example of that. Whenever I started testing these weapons, it really made me realize how valuable stabs are, and I'm really starting to get into these heavy thrust and sword and spear type weapons. I'm thinking about what my next weapon tier list will be when it's just a category. Let me know if you're interested in any of those. But because of its great damage, great stance damage, piercing attacks, and the fact that it outclasses its other only infusible option on the weapon class, it may not be the most exciting, but it's definitely a top 10 option. My Guiding Moonlight herself, she is just a gem of a weapon, it's just chef's kiss. It's a toss up between this or the Zweihander for my favorite weapon in the series, and they're really pretty far ahead of the rest, but I don't think I'm being biased with the placement here. I truly love this weapon with my whole heart. I'll get that out of the way first. I still remember getting into the series with Dark Souls 3, and whenever I got stuck, I went back to the Claymore and ended up using it for almost every late game boss, and when Ring City came out, that's what I used. There are so many memories attached to it, and after playing the whole series, she has yet to let me down. In Elden Ring, the Claymore is yet again a great weapon. As always, it's good on any build, and any infusion, it's truly a jack of all trades. It's best on a strength build where it is your best infusible great sword for a strength build, and it just gets that beautiful thrust attack for the heavy attack. We all know it, we all love it, it just hits different. The great swords are just one of the most populated weapon classes. It may be the most, I'm not looking it up though. And the Claymore easily has the best moveset among them all. And that's really all I want in a weapon. 
Let me explain that a little bit and kind of why I made this list. There are just so many weapons with easy weapon skills spam that really make most of Elden Ring's bosses trivial. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with enjoying the game you want. It's your time, it's how you enjoy it. So summoning, spirit ash, weapon skills, just use that every attack, do it all. Do not ever listen to anyone who tells you how to enjoy things, especially a video game, it's not real life. But the way I like to play is to use the weapon skill as a tool I don't like to use it as my main attack using it over and over again. So I kind of think about it as something I do like maybe every minute or two. That's like my special ability. It definitely puts me at a disadvantage, but it's how I started getting into the genre of Dark Souls 3 when you only really had limited FP and one wep weapon skill that came with the weapon. You couldn't change them, right? Part of the reason I play these games is for the difficulty and there really just is something about overcoming the odds and killing gods with just a guy and his sword instead of using just magical light beams of magic and faith and holy damage and just giant ass meteors. It's just how I like to play it and like overcoming the odds, not going hollow. That was a lot of the themes that got me into this. So as I'm writing this script and reading it out loud, I am realizing that this entry into my ranking really is more a love letter to the Claymore. So, uh, yeah, I hope that's okay. We all love the Claymore. But that's where it finds itself. Great weapon. Really great strength weapon, two-handed. But all in all, you can't go wrong, and it's a classic for a reason. Number eight, we have the Great Katana. This is similar to the Milady in that the moveset is so smooth. Obviously, in a different way, because this one feels like it had some weight behind it. This thing really does have it all. It has its own Ash of War, similar to the Wing Stance with Milady, and that one really is the most fun. It's the Overhead Stance, which is straight out of Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. I think the fact that Heavy Attacks became a very viable option, I mean, think about how many times I've mentioned Stance Damage in this video, that they really did open themselves up to make more weapon types and make more unique kind of weapons. Think about Dark Souls 3, how you would kill bosses, and even when in PvP a lot, you'd pick up a Lothric Knight Sword, you'd press R1, then press R1 again, and then keep pressing R1, and you beat the game. That's how you beat the game. You are at a disadvantage if you chose any other weapon. Now hopefully you couldn't tell with my delivery, but that was completely off script there because before I started talking, I was watching this fight a little bit, and it just got me hyped up to see how they continued out to themselves. But yeah, let me talk about the weapon itself. Now this weapon has good scaling on a heavy infusion and a keen infusion. I think two-handing is better than power stance, so almost always with a lot of weapons, unless it's a straight sword or curved sword, so I would definitely two-hand this as you see I'm doing here and put it heavy infused. We got really into the moveset already, but you have passive bleed and the stance damage of right in line with great swords. So if you use great swords and katanas, it's kind of like a mix of those. At least that's how I felt about it. I didn't use it much until this fight, and now I'm really excited to pick it back up. But yeah, all in all, a phenomenal weapon, and number eight is a good spot for it. The Guardian Sword Spear gets some extra points in this ranking for making me nostalgic for Dark Souls 3 and the first time I fought the Nameless King. It always reminds me of him when I see a sword spear. The Guardian Sword Spear says it gets an A in dexterity, but this is yet another example of don't trust FromSoft and don't believe their lies, because it's clearly an S kind of scaling, but it's invisible. This thing hits like an absolute freight train, and it gets more out of dexterity than off the top of my head any weapon I can think of. As I've said continuously throughout the video, I value moveset too much. It's why I'm making an infusible tier list after all. The Sword Spear has beautiful diagonal swinging light attacks, that make it much harder to miss. Even though they're going upwards, it really kind of goes far enough out to the side that you're not really missing its better hit detection. And Halberds get some rare Ashes of War, such as Storm Assault, Ice Spear, Phantom Slash, and Spinning Strikes, but I found it also works with really well with more common ones such as Sword Dance and Spinning Slash. But I wanted to give a special shout out to Phantom Slash because I saw it, I wish I remembered their name, I'm sorry. Someone was talking about it, a creator on here, and I never see this in co-op, but I used it on Mog the other day on New Game Plus 7, and it absolutely destroyed him. Definitely give that one a try, because I don't think anybody really pays attention to it. It's an awesome and really fun Ash. 
This is definitely my favorite dex weapon, I would say. And it's something you can farm right at the beginning of the game from a tree spirit. There's guardians around it in the Weeping Peninsula. Definitely something you can take for the entire game and it won't really ever get. Great hammers do the highest stance damage of any weapon category. They're also much quicker than you would think. However, they're very top heavy. On paper, they seem like they're gonna be a really stacked class because of their just general abilities of that weapon class, but they have limited options. So the Great Stars is the top dog standing head and shoulders above them all. This monster heals on successive hits and has passive bleed. To my knowledge, it's the only weapon that does both of these things. You'd think it would be lacking in just raw damage, but not at all. It's very good on a strength build for its damage alone, even before you factor in the passive bleed and heal effect. I've been gassing up the Wild Strikes Ash of War a lot recently, but that can apply bleed quickly and get a lot of successive hits in for those heals. The Great Stars really is just a powerhouse, and it easily outclasses the rest of the Great Hammers. It's significantly better, and it's definitely one of the best weapons in the entire game. Next up we have the Knight Rider Glaive. It's kind of like the strength counterpart to the Guardian Sword Spear. And real quick guys, Halberds will be my next tier list video. And I'm very happy with how the first two came out and you guys seem to really like them. The support was awesome and so unreal. I really appreciate it guys. I really want those to feel more epic than kind of this one which is more laid back. So I did tone down the lore and I tried to make these shorter. So, I kind of want those to be more of an occasion because I know people like them, and they do take a lot of work to make. Anyway though, the Knight Rider Glaive gets its S scaling in strength, and it's one of the very best weapons in Elden Ring for a strength build. Its moveset is simple, heavy attacks for overheads, and light attacks for horizontal slashes. If you are curious, a common strategy is to use a War Ash of War with this to alter its moveset. However, I'm yet to really try it, so I can't give you an honest opinion on it. When you fully optimize a strength build, you will be doing tremendous AR. The Knight Rider's Glaive Reach is near the top of its weapon class. What I like about the Halberd class in general is there's really no absolutely essential talismans outside of the two-handed sword. So when two-handing, you definitely want to use that at all times, which you already are going to be doing with the Knight Rider Glaive as it's a strength weapon. Please say a prayer to our Lord and Savior Maizaki for blessing us of strength chads with that talisman. It's really evening the playing field which I love for us. It's pretty simple what makes this weapon great though. Damage, damage, and more damage. We now reach the S plus tier reserved for only the best weapons in Elden Ring. These are the weapons that despite being infusible and don't have weapon skills that are completely overpowered that you can L2 spam, they really are just so good they're in that same tier. Maybe they don't reach the same heights as the Darkwing Greatsword and the Blasphemous Blade, but they are at least in that tier. The Greatsword has been dethroned as the best infusible weapon in Elden Ring. It drops to fourth place because there is another Colossal Sword that now outclasses it. This is not the same situation though as earlier we talked about the Lance versus the Messmer's Soldier Spear or something similar because the gap is not as wide and the Guts Greatsword was lapping almost all of the competition before, spoiler, the Fire Knight's Greatsword. It almost feels wrong to drop it at this point, but realistically, it has to be done. The Cross Naginata. This weapon has a bad reputation for being power stance in PvP and just spamming run attacks. Power stance weapons are not included in this ranking as a reminder. If this was, it would probably be close to number one, if not number one, against the Bandit's Curve Sword, it would be those two. But the Cross Naginata has so many amazing things going for it. Almost every spear has Pierce attacks and only those. The Cross Naginata has horizontal slashes, vertical attacks, and pierce attacks. And because it's a spear, you know we gotta say, thrust is a plus. I really can't think of any weapons that have access to all three of those. The moveset is just second to none. The only one that really comes close is the Fire Knight's Greatsword. If that wasn't enough, it has bleed, and we all know how absurd bleed is. This weapon is a flat out monster, don't let the reputation it has as a power stance only weapon fool you. It's almost as good just as a two-hander in PvE. The Nagakiba is bar none the best katana in Elden Ring, a, a class already that has just so many good options across the board. I think most people know what makes this weapon great. It has bleed of course, it has good stance damage if you use unsheath which you probably should. 
a poking attack not available to other katanas, and it reaches just three football fields long. It's kind of absurd how long it is compared to the other katanas. It's just a ridiculous weapon. All four of these, you can make an argument for number one, or really all three, because the Guts Greatsword, in my opinion, is totally outclassed by the Fire Knight's Greatsword, which is our number one. Its moveset, second only relative to its class, to the Cross Naginata, to the Spears. Its damage gets really crazy on the right build. And of course, it has the Light Greatsword moveset for the light attacks, and then it has the chargeable heavy attacks of the Swyhander. These are just without a doubt the four best infusible weapons. I can see arguments for other ones that are like outside of this top four, but these are definitely those. And I love you guys. I'll see you in the next one. Check out the videos to the above left and right. If you want to see some other Elden Ring rankings, love you guys.